Uh, welcome everyone to this online class that we are doing with my friend and former teacher, Dr. Ruben Rosario Rodriguez. Uh, we're going to talk about Calvin, someone who has uh, something of a conflicted reputation in the Christian church, depending on your theological persuasion. Uh, uh, but there's a lot more uh, to him than meets the eye. And so Ruben's going to unpack a, a different side of him um, for us. Uh, so before we get started, Ruben, um, let us know who you are, where you are, how you got to be, where, where, where you are, what you do. Great. Um, I, uh, my name is Ruben. I am a, uh, an ordained Presbyterian minister, just celebrated 25 years uh, in, in ministry and originally started in New York City Presbytery, member of Broadway Presbyterian Church, was ordained a deacon fairly early on probably age 19, worked with the homeless outreach ministries um, that the church ran. And from there, decided to become ordained, was all prepared to do urban ministry. And my first call was a town of 800 people in rural Ohio. <laughs> so the culture shock was huge going from Manhattan's Upper West Side to a town where there were more people in my apartment building in New York City than in my town. Um, but I, I nonetheless uh, kept involved in, in social outreach ministries, would spend my days off in Columbus, Ohio. I, I managed the largest uh, shelter provider for homeless families. Um, and while I was planning to go back to doctoral studies after 10 years in the parish, after five years, I happened to visit the campus of Princeton Seminary while there, I met with a few professors. Long story short, I went back, and that's when I met you. Um, I graduated in 2004 and have been teaching at, of all places, the Jesuit Catholic University, St. Louis University, since then. So I've had to kind of put into practice some of the ecumenism that Bart uh, kind of uh, ingrained into me at Princeton Seminary. <laughs> And here I am. <laughs> uh, so I will make you the host now, Ruben, and you can uh, begin your presentation for us. Uh, so folks, uh, I'm sure a year into the pandemic almost now, you know the drill. And so uh, if you want to leave questions either in the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen or in the chat, I'll keep an eye on those. Uh, and then we'll allow some time, uh, maybe around the 50 minute mark uh, for, for okay. Ruben to tackle those. Um, All right. So there you go, Ruben. Thank you. All right. I will share some slides or just an outline. Nothing spectacular, but it helps me stay on track and hopefully will help some of you follow along. Uh, the title we chose was Calvin's Political Theology of Exile. And this week one, I want to focus on, on Calvin in context, setting the 16th century Genevan context in order to understand uh, Calvin's ministry and, and to maybe overcome some of the, the stereotypes we have of Calvin as the sour theocrat who wanted to kind of impose a strict rule on everyone. Um, uh, and in fact, what we find is, is a very human pastor who, who lived a very modest life and who um, always kind of lived along the margins of society for most of his life. Um, his father had great dreams for him, that's why he studied law, but Calvin got caught up in Luther's reforms, became a, an evangelical, which at the time meant something completely different than in our current context, <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, wrote a, a very important and moving sermon calling for the King of France, Francis I, to um, be tolerant and supportive of the evangelical movement, someone nailed a copy of that sermon onto the king's bed, and Calvin was immediately uh, banned and was uh, basically without trial uh, put, put in for the death sentence and had to flee Paris and never return to his uh, homeland, always wanted to, and, and lived as an exile for most of the rest of his life. We'll, we'll unpack all of this in the next few weeks. 
Um, but basically, it wasn't until about five years before his death that he was finally made a citizen of Geneva, despite all the things he'd done for Geneva uh, over the years. Um, so this week, we're going to kind of set the stage, uh, introduce some of the, the, the themes and topics of, of Calvin as a liberationist, which is, I think, what, what people hear that and cringe or, or are shocked. Um, and I'll kind of explain that today. Then next week, second week, we'll look at, at how Calvin carried out this vision of an engaged political and public theology uh, through a look at the social welfare ministries in the city of Geneva. Third week, I want to look at, at Calvin's theology of exile in, in greater detail, and I call it the undocumented Calvin. As I said, he lived a life of a political refugee, political exile, and a resident alien um, for most of his life. And then finally, I um, want to wrestle with, with some of the darker aspects of the Reformed theological tradition, its, its contribution to slavery in, in, in the North Atlantic slave trade, um, it's, its awful role in um, apartheid in South Africa, and yet um, we'll discover that, that the Calvinist tradition was also part of what helped overturn apartheid. It was also uh, part of, of the abolitionist movement here in the United States. In fact, uh, the Presbyterian Church in the state of New York uh, did not want to um, approve the U.S. Constitution in 1787 until um, it included um, an, the elimination of slavery. Unfortunately, I didn't know in, order, yeah, it's in order to maintain um, kind of unity between the colonies, that the new government, um, a compromise was reached. We all know about the three-fifths compromise and, and its horrible history. Um, but that's kind of the next four weeks in a nutshell. Okay, um, good. So, the claim that Calvin was a liberationist or a proto-liberationist. Um, it's a claim that, that I didn't originate, actually. Richard Shaw, a professor at Princeton Theological Seminary and, and one of the key figures in the development of liberation theology. He documented a lot of it during his work as, as a mission, Presbyterian missionary in Brazil. Um, he edited an important journal called Church and Society, um, at Iglesia y Sociedad and um, published uh, a lot of the, the liberation theologians at a time when, when no other journals would. And he made the argument back in 1991 in a, a great little book where he compares Luther and Calvin and their reforms to what was happening in Latin America in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, but when I took it a little step further in my first book, Racism and God Talk, um, it was received with some shock and surprise, and uh, the first review of my book began with this sentence. Any text that suggests that John Calvin is a liberation theologian deserves a closer look. Unfortunately, no one thought that was a selling point, and <laughs> the book did not fly off the shelf, although it has sold pretty well over the years. Um, but again, my point that I want to make today is that Calvin, in fact, has much in common with liberation theologians in, in two aspects. One is in, in grounding his, his reading of scripture in, in the, the teaching of the Hebrew prophets. And the second is um, the fact that their social context was one of, of great social changes. Um, and we'll look today at the question, was Calvin a, a revolutionary? Um, I think most people would say no, and perhaps they're right. But Calvin did bring about some, some great social changes that, that continue to, to, to impact our society today. And the first thing that I think everyone associates with liberation theology is the notion of God's preferential option for the poor. And one of the things that, that I've always argued in my scholarship, in my teaching, is that these themes of liberation and God's preferential option for the poor and oppressed are biblical themes. The language of liberation is, is a word that's also translated as salvation, but it is a biblical word in, in, in both the Hebrew and Greek uh, books of the Bible. It's a theme that you'll find throughout the Old and New Testaments. Critics of liberation theology will say that this is like a, an imposition of Marxism onto the biblical text. But um, I think 
uh, later, after the kind of initial shock wore off, I think theologians recognize that the, the reading of scripture by the liberation theologians is faithful to the Hebrew prophets, and the Hebrew prophets were such a key factor to the ministry of Jesus that, that what we're reading and understanding and wrestling with is not something from the Bible, but something that's inherent to the biblical text itself. Now, Calvin never used the language preferential option, but I think if you read with me, and I'll read it slowly, I, I have it up on the screen. If you read with me uh, Calvin's commentary 82, even though he did not use this language of preferential option, I think what he's describing is, is exactly what someone like, like Father Gutierrez in Peru would call the preferential option. And this is from Calvin's commentary on Psalm 82. We are here briefly taught that a just and well-regulated government will be distinguished for maintaining the rights of the poor and afflicted. For those who are exposed and easy prey to the cruelty and wrongs of the rich have no less need of the assistance and protection of magistrates than the sick have of the aid of the physician. Were the truth deeply fixed in the minds of kings and other judges that they are appointed to be the guardians of the poor, and that a special part of this duty lies in resisting the wrongs which are done to them, and in repressing all unrighteous violence, perfect righteousness would become triumphant through the whole world. Um, it's, it's a striking um, call to, to recognize that if we are guided by, by biblical virtues, and we live in a, an imperfect world, then part of the Christian vocation is to do something about it. And the instrument God has put into place is the state. Um, there are certain assumptions to understanding Calvin, and, and I'm going to get to them, but, but I want to just, again, talk about the impact of Calvin, because he is someone who is, people aren't neutral about Calvin. They either hate him or, or they think he is a, a very unique theologian um, who has much to teach us. Um, and I think that the image of him as this uh, Geneva a theocracy is, is, is false. It's a, it's a caricature. It's probably one uh, that his critics raised um, and lifted up. Um, everyone always points to the fact that um, he sent the, the Spanish uh, heretic who denied the Trinity and, and, and allowed the government to, to, to burn him at the stake. Um, well, Calvin was not unique in that. Um, in the 16th century, uh, church laws were also state laws. And there was not a, a Christian nation in Europe at that time who wouldn't have tried a heretic and put him or her to death. So we cannot project or impose a modern view onto our understanding of Calvin. We need to read him carefully. We need to, to peel away the layers and, and see that which is um, faithful to the scriptures, but also recognize that like any theologian, Calvin is a product of his age. Um, Calvin was not uh, involved in many interfaith dialogues. It's believed that, that he, he knew of Islam, but most of what he knew um, was secondhand. Um, don't even know if he met a Jewish person in his life. His when he talks about Judaism and, and the Jewish people, it's it's through the lens of the Old Testament. And anyone who knows history knows that rabbinic Judaism in the 16th century was was not the Judaism of the Old Testament. So so we need to understand that he lived in a bubble, a, a Christian bubble, and that um, he addressed fellow Christians. And so given that, um, what we find is, is a surprisingly cosmopolitan teaching. Calvin um, made certain assumptions, though. He had a lot to say about social ethics. He had a lot to say about economic justice and always did so by appealing to scripture. Um, everyone talks about Calvin and double predestination. Yes, the doctrine of election is huge in Calvin. You can't make sense of his theology without it. But the core belief isn't that some people are damned and some people are saved. 
In fact, when writing about that doctrine, um, Calvin called it uh, that wretched doctrine. He didn't like it, but he had to deal with it because as he read scripture, he found texts that seemed to, to support this notion. And, and keep in mind, he didn't invent predestination or double predestination. You'll find it in Luther as well. Um, but at the core of this doctrine of election is really the core belief that God is creator and redeemer, and that we know God as creator because we have been redeemed in Christ. God is redeemer. Um, and so Calvin finds himself writing not for those who are non-Christian. He's not very interested in apologetics or convincing others about the, the wisdom of Christianity. He's a pastor, and he's concerned about those who, have, who, those who have been moved by the Spirit to embrace the faith in Christ. His focus is to help them live the Christian life. And the chief axiom for this what motivates us to act and to trust that however flawed and sinful we are, however flawed and imperfect our state is, however flawed and imperfect our churches are, we, we act in good faith because we believe that God is good and God is just. And that even out of our sinful acts, God can bring good and God can bring justice. So if you're willing to grant that to Calvin, in other words, if you're willing to read him and give him the benefit of the doubt, and trust that what motivates him is a sincere belief in, in helping people live a life in imitation of Christ, then I think you'll be surprised by the Calvin we discover. But again, we have to put things in context. Um, in my first book, Racism and God Talk, I had a section on the fact that Jesus never seems to explicitly condemn slavery. Now, I'm not going to take us on too long a side, a side track here, but, but I bring it up because I, I, I do so to put it in context. There were no first century abolitionists. You're not going to find a Greek philosopher, a Roman philosopher, uh, a Persian mystic. No one in the first century was advocating for the elimination of slavery. However, it's interesting that the first explicit call to eliminate the institution of slavery came from a Christian theologian, Gregory of Nyssa, one of the Cappadocian fathers, who basically argued from the doctrine of the image of God that all humans are created in the image of God to then argue that slavery is, is, is a great wrong because it enslaves God and, and therefore he called for its elimination. And you're going to find a similar argument, actually, in Calvin's Institutes. Um, so what I'm saying is, um, it's not that Christ didn't want to eliminate slavery, but rather that as we have received Christ in the Gospels, the stories preserved by those who followed Christ, um, those who heard Christ were too frightened of the notion that as Christians, they needed to overthrow slavery or eliminate slavery. And keep in mind that the earliest Christians, most of them themselves were slaves. Um, so in that context, let's remember that in the 16th century, um, few people would argue for the equality uh, of the sexes. Um, it was not uncommon for Christians to view other peoples from other nations under one of three categories. Either they were fellow Christians, they were uh, heathens, uh, in this case Muslims, who, who um, or infidels, who, who believed in God but didn't follow Christ. Um, or as, as we discovered the new world, they were pagans, people who had never known Christ. So either if you're an evangelical Protestant, then, then Catholics are ap apostates. If you're a Catholic, Protestants are apostates. Um, if you're a European Christian, uh, Muslims and Jews are infidels. And then if, if, if you're a European Christian, the peoples of Asia, Africa, and um, Latin America, who had never heard Christ preached, were pagans. And, and that was the world. It was a stratified world. I believe that, that Christianity um, 
was the true religion and that as Christians, their job was to spread that faith. Um, and in that context, uh, Thomas Hobbes, the uh, political philosopher who himself was, was in the Reformed tradition in Leviathan, described the human condition, life in the, in the early modern period or, or late medieval period um, as solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And so we need to understand that, that this was a period of great upheavals. Um, one of the things about Calvin's chief work, the Institutes of the Christian Religion, is that with every edition, and he revised it many times, um, the original came out in 1536, the final uh, edition we have today was finished in 1559, um, he wrote it in Latin, he did a French version in 1541, um, but throughout all of these different editions, the prefatory letter at the beginning of the book was kept the same. It was a letter addressed to King Francis I of France, asking him for tolerance of uh, an acceptance of the evangelicals and asking a, an end to the religious wars of the time period. Uh, 1523 was a very important year. It was the year of the peasant revolt in Germany. It's perhaps the biggest black mark in Martin Luther's reformation. And Luther ended up siding with the state and with the German princes who um, sent in armored knights to put down this peasant rebellion of, of farmers armed with tools and, and farming implements. And um, something like 6,000 peasants were killed in a matter of hours by these armored and armed knights. Um, it, it was a revolutionary moment. If you read the literature, the things that, that the peasants wanted um, were very radical. They wanted what, what we might call a socialized, socialist, even communist uh, uh, economy. Um, and they wanted to, to do away with this kind of hierarchical stratification of society. Um, and originally, uh, many of them were moved to, to make these demands after reading Luther and after reading uh, Luther's uh, call to reformation. Um, but when, it, when, when the time came and it became violent, Luther spoke against the peasant revolts. He spoke against the, the aristocracy as well. And he said it was their abuses that led to the revolt. But in the end, he didn't condemn the princes in, it, with the same force he condemned the peasants. Um, that event affected Calvin greatly. And so I asked the question earlier, was Calvin a revolutionary? I, and I think a careful reading of the history will say, in fact, Calvin was quite the social conservative in some regards. He wanted to maintain a peaceful order. And if you read that prefatory letter, the main reason for it is he was well aware that in history, whenever there's a call to revolution to overthrow a tyrannical government, it's the poor masses that suffer most. The poor, the peasants, women, children, the elderly, they're the victims of armed conflict. And so Calvin was trying to avoid a repetition of the events of 1523. And so if you read him, you find that, that his comments seem very conservative. He basically says, if you live under a tyrannical government, um, trust God, pray, um, but it's not in your power to, to do something about it, to overthrow that government. And that's, that's bleak because a lot of people were living under great oppression. And during Calvin's time in Geneva, uh, a great many refugees fleeing political persecution, fleeing uh, Catholic repression, um, flooded Geneva, doubled the population in the matter of, of one year, uh, and, and really pushed the, the resources within the city and created all sorts of, of xenophobia and tensions between native Genevans and foreign immigrants, immigrants who came from not only France, but Italy, Spain, um, the United Kingdom, Great Britain, um, even Poland. So 
again, these are all things that seem very familiar to us, this kind of um, massive migration, kind of periods of political instability that lead to, to populations being dislocated. And then that causes um, kind of a, an ethnic and racial um, xenophobia. So all of this, life was poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Um, all of this is the context and the background for understanding Calvin. But even though he was weary of tyrannical abuse and did not want innocent lives dying, we're going to see in a little bit that, that Calvin did have a way to resist tyranny. And so we'll talk about that a little later. However, I wanted to kind of set up the, the kind of spiritual world of the late medieval and early reformation period we need to understand that that again for calvin this is all about knowing god and obeying god and the religious world of the 16th century was uh one in which liturgy and prayer defined religion and that as as people in that in that worldview understood religion to be religious was to focus all aspects of your life on god but the truth is that the average believer probably worked 14, 15 hours a day, manual labor, um, just to, to feed his or her family. And so not everyone could be religious. Most people did not live lives focused completely on God. What you had was a spiritual hierarchy. The conception of the holy that dominated the world was, was one of being sacred or holy was to be set apart consecrated and devoted to God. And in the medieval tradition, it was easy to identify the holy. There were holy times, holy places, holy people, holy things, the, the obsession with relics, um, that the sacred calendar was set apart from the secular calendar. To be holy was to be set apart for God. But along with this notion of holiness came a stratified social order with different ranks of Christians. Each vocation has a different status as well as function. Some people were called to be holy. Some people were called to live secular lives. Um, and we need to understand what is meant by that term secular. Today, when we think of the word secular, we think of, of um, a life without God, a life without religion, a secular state over against the church. Um, well, the, the words religious meant something very different um, in the 16th century. Religious referred to those whose lives were consecrated and set apart, and, and they lived in a cloistered monastic setting devoted to God 24 hours a day in constant prayer seven days a week. Secular refers to the rest of us, people who lived in the day-to-day -day world. Um, you could be a religious priest, a secular priest. A secular priest is a priest who serves laypersons. A religious priest is a priest who, who ministers to other clergy in a monastic setting. But this created some, some major problems. And, and what you find is that when Luther nailed his 95 theses, um, he was reflecting uh, issues that had been uh, discussed, troubling the, the church for, for a while now, and, and it kind of reached a boiling point. The typical parish priest, the secular priest, was illiterate, didn't know how to read and write. They'd memorized uh, the liturgies, they had memorized prayers in Latin, and would often preach sermons that had nothing to do with the scriptures, just moral stories, etc. Over time, because the church hierarchy did not concern itself with the spiritual formation of its secular priests, um, you had a, a priesthood that was not properly paid, not properly trained, and many of them had to uh, find other sources of income to survive. Um, that often meant, uh, among other things, that um, there was great immorality among the priesthood, um, including uh, priests who had families out of wedlock and sired children, et cetera. You, you, what developed was this two-tiered hierarchical spiritual, spirituality. Now, at the same time that all of this is happening, um, you have the rise of an educated 
the class. Um, in the past, it used to be only the children of the nobility were educated, but as you have uh, this kind of economic shift from a feudal economy into a mercantile economy, um, you have a rising middle class. Um, the, the middle class uses its wealth and money to marry into the nobility, and so they want their children educated. And so you have a, a growing spread of literacy among the merchant class, and they begin to recognize that the priests that they've been interacting with are not very well educated, and so it creates this great dissatisfaction among laypersons, this hunger for spiritual guidance, and it exposes a lot of the superstition within popular piety. And so you have someone like Erasmus, who was a humanist and a priest, who made a career, he was a best-selling author, he made a career of writing books on spirituality for laypersons. He never once served the parish, even though he was a priest, because he, he was able to live such, such a good life selling um, these books on spirituality, these handbooks of Christian spirituality to uh, educated laypersons. Um, and at the same time, most believers, most Christians who were poor and illiterate themselves, the clergy controlled the means of salvation and the sacraments existed as their only way to God. So all of this was this brewing, bubbling cauldron that led to great dissatisfaction, that led to reformation. And, and Calvin was in the midst of that. Calvin was someone who um, committed to transforming the church. And the first bit of Calvin most people were familiar with was a section of the Institutes called the Golden Booklet of a True Christian Life. It was um, a manual on how to live the Christian life, and it was translated and disseminated throughout Europe. Um, it was the first bit of John Calvin translated into English, and at the heart of it is this uh, almost slap on the wrist on, on, on some of Luther's writings uh, and this emphasis that, yes, we're not saved by works, yet not without works. And it's a look at what the Christian life looks like once you've received grace. Um, this booklet is, is taken out of book three of the Institutes, which is a very large book written as a textbook for pastors. Um, but at the heart of this spirituality, what distinguishes Reformed spirituality is this notion that, that our lives do not belong to us, they belong to God. We are not our own, we are God's. And as followers of Christ, our, our chief our piety is, is that of prayer. Prayer, not only um, asking for things, but prayer as, as learning to listen to God. And what Calvin wanted to do in, in this spirituality was to bring spirituality and religion out of the cloister and into the world. And so you have this notion in Calvin that we're all called to, to different vocations, but in whatever journey we find ourselves, in whatever vocation, we can find our true spiritual calling in the midst of that. Um, and that's a, something that I think is at the heart of, of, of American thinking on piety. But this is Calvin's definition of, of faith or piety. I'll call, I call piety that reverence joined with love of God, which the knowledge of his benefits induces. For until people recognize that they owe everything to God, that they are nourished by his fatherly care, that he is the author of their every good, they will never yield him willing service. Um, I teach Calvin in my intro theology class, and I teach at a university that has a, a large international population that has people of many different faiths, people of no faith at all, and when we go through this little booklet of the Christian life, uh, I was shocked and surprised once when, when a student wrote a paper about how similar it was to his understanding of Islam. It was a Muslim student. This notion of submitting your will to God. That that's what Islam means. Um, and this notion of, of yielding to God our willing service is, is something that, that he felt resonated with his, his Muslim faith. So that's what Calvin's 
piety is all about. It's, it's that of, of a faithful response to God's grace through our obedience. Um, in that context, there are certain things that distinguish us as Christians. Um, we confess our faith. We behave accordingly. Um, we participate in the sacraments. Um, but throughout all of this, we have to remember that, that the visible church is what the world sees, but that we don't know who is truly saved, right? And so the church exercises earthly discipline, even though ultimately it's an act of grace, and, and it educates people in the Christian life and it, and it um, seeks to evangelize and convert because we never know the means by which God brings people into the kingdom. And so we all have to act with the humility that our earthly discipline, while not God's will, we, we offer to God in obedience, um, in effect, hoping that it'll be instruments of God's will. How are we for time? J Jason? We've got 15 minutes or so. Okay. Before we can yeah. turn it over. All right. Um, and so again, very quickly, um, the practice of daily living as response to grace um, through a life of faith and obedience. That summarizes Calvin's understanding of faith. And he use the Ten Commandments to guide our Christian behavior, but he read the Ten Commandments through the lens of the Sermon on the Mount. And there's this great passage where he talks about the Sixth Commandment, uh, thou shalt not murder. Um, and he basically says, it, it's not enough to refrain from killing another human being. But rather, if, we, if we've read the Sermon on the Mount and understood it properly, when, when, when Jesus reads, thou shall not murder, the, the kind of yoke that Christ has, has, has laid on us is such that we are now called to do anything and everything in our power, not just to refrain from violence and killing other people, but to do whatever in our power to help our neighbor, to make their life better. So if our neighbor's children are, are hungry, we have a duty to feed them. And if we don't, it's as if we've committed murder. Um, it's, it's, it's an amazing and very consistent ethic that he finds in the Sermon on the Mount. And it allows him to then go back to that Old Testament law and use it as a guidepost to live the Christian life. And then he defines four central features of the Christian life. Self-denial. We pray every day, uh, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Um, Thy will be done, right? Uh, on earth as it is in heaven. Um, they, us, um, we are called to lives of service and, and always with the understanding that, that we don't carry that cross alone. Um, and then as we are on this journey, in order to keep ourselves faithful, we have to keep our eyes on the prize, if you will. We have to meditate on the future life and recognize that, that the suffering and pain of this life um, if we live righteous lives, we're going to meet resistance. And so we have to under, trust and understand that, that that is the, the price worth paying for the future life, eternal life in God's kingdom. But at the same time, he's not an escapist. He's not a Platonist. He's not someone who emphasizes uh, the es eschaton, the future time, uh, to the exclusion of this life. And he's not someone who spiritualizes our faith to the exclusion of this material world we live in. Um, rather, he, he basically says that we are given this life as a gift and, and we ought to enjoy it and cherish it. Um, but whenever something of this life becomes a stumbling block and keeps us or threatens to keep us from the future life, then we need to, to exercise some self-denial. But we're not these dour, uh, angry Puritans that everyone envisions. And in fact, um, Calvin loved art and Calvin loved music. He just didn't think it had a place in, in worship. He didn't want anything to detract from the word of God. Um, 
so in, in effect, the law uh, exists in, in three ways. The, the Torah, the law, is used to, to point out our sin, to help us recognize uh, how far we are from, from perfect obedience. Um, the law also serves as a deterrent for the unregenerate. God espoused, uh, established not just the, the biblical law, but he also established the civil law, government, to maintain social order. But now that we have Christ, now that we've received grace, we're able to read that law of, of, of the Torah through the lens of the gospel and use it to guide our way, to help us on our spiritual journey. And as such, Christians are, are kind of caught between two worlds. Calvin sees in the scriptures this transcendent reality contrasted with the ordinary world of daily life. Um, and, and for him, that's the kingdom of God. It's at once transcendent and within the realm of experience. It's very similar, and, and he was greatly influenced by Augustine of Hippo and, and his city of God. The fact that we are citizens both of the, the human city and the, and the divine city. And the kingdom is both within and above this world. What does that mean? Well, it means that, that for Calvin, we are called to live a, a very public faith. And so you can find in Calvin a public theology. And it views the work of civil government as divine. God has established civil government so that, quote, humanity may be maintained among men. Civil governance is, quote, a calling, not only lawful before God, but also the most sacred and by far the most honorable of all callings in the whole life of mortal men. And keep in mind, this was from a, a Christian preacher who wrote at great length about what a, a, a sacred calling uh, preaching is and how important it is to, to stand in a pulpit and speak for God, right? And in spite of all that, Calvin believed that, that civil governance, that, that a call to public office was a sacred calling, the most honorable of sacred calling. And so therefore, for Calvin and all those Protestant traditions that have been influenced by Calvin, the establishment of a just social order is part and parcel of the Christian life. And it's no coincidence that I think seven or eight of the signers of the Declaration of um, Independence in the US in 1776 were Presbyterian clergy. They had this, this view of a kind of public and political theology that informed their, their involvement. So I wanna return then to this notion of reform versus revolution because Calvin was weary and, 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 and concerned that if, if he espoused a political revolution against a tyrannical government like Francis I of France, the consequences would be dire, would be dismal, that, that more people would die, more innocent people would die. Um, and so Calvin did not call for violent revolution. If anything, in his letter, he reminded King Francis just how peaceful and nonviolent the evangelicals were. And in fact, the, the Huguenot Protestants who, who were the Protestants in France that, that Calvin was associated with have a reputation for nonviolence. And in fact, during um, World War II, refused to join the French resistance. And many of them um, considered them traitors. Um, but uh, if you ever have a chance to read uh, a, this book or, or watch the documentary called Weapons of the Spirit, it's about a group of French Huguenot Protestants in Le Chambon, France. Um, they were pacifists, they were committed to nonviolence, but they worked to save the lives of 5,000 Jews, most of them children, and helped them flee to the United States um, during the war. And did so, um, basically the church was like right across the street from the Gestapo headquarters in occupied France, in their village there. Um, it's an amazing story, I urge you to look it up. The, the documentary, you can do a web search for it, it's called Weapons of the Spirit. Um, it's an amazing story. But all of that as, as a way of pointing out that um, Calvin would rather err on the side of nonviolent resistance than armed revolution. And therefore, he's been criticized uh, 
or tolerating or in fact facilitating tyranny. And so you can point to certain places, uh, South Africa under apartheid, um, even Germany un uh, under the, the rise of the Nazis where, where reform theologies maybe were not as, as quick to offer resistance as they could have been. Um, and, and I respond to that, that yes, but, but the Barman Declaration originated in, in the reformed churches. Um, you go to South Africa and, and, and the black South African pastors who gave us the Belhar Confession were, were all reformed theologians. Um, so the, the reformed tradition has a history of resisting tyranny, of being politically engaged. But for Calvin, that doesn't mean armed revolution. Rather, he understood, remember this high notion of, of, of the calling of public service. He believed that those who were appointed to, to certain public offices or elected to certain public offices, it was their responsibility to maintain justice and overthrow tyranny. Not the average Joe on the street, but those who have been placed by God in positions of power and influence. In other words, to put it in the context of what we've been witnessing here in the United States, um, the, the way that, that the Republican Party has kind of radicalized itself and, and, and has allowed an extreme group to um, control the party, um, Calvin's response, it's up to those leaders within that party to, to resist what happened and to put a stop to it. Um, unfortunately, we, we haven't seen that. Uh, who knows where that's gonna end. But that being said, Calvin does acknowledge that sometimes tyrannical rulers are so tyrannical that we do have to stand against evil. And so um, from a sermon on 2 Samuel, which was a series of sermons about kingship and governance uh, it was a, a study of, of King's rule and his uh, relationship to, to the priest Samuel. Um, Calvin wrote this. All Christians must, quote, take as strong a stand against evil as we can. This command is given to everyone, not only to princes, magistrates, and officers of justice, but to all private persons as well. Now, he doesn't spell out how we ought to offer that resistance to work to overthrow unjust government, but he acknowledges our right as Christians to do so. So I think that's an important nuance. He's not a calling for armed revolution, but he is calling for Christians to do whatever is in their power to resist evil and tyrannical governments. So looking ahead, Remembering that for Calvin, all theology begins and ends with scripture. We're going to see next week as, as we begin to look at, at Calvin's ministries of compassion, social welfare ministries in Geneva, that he took very seriously uh, that passage from Matthew 25, the parable of the sheep and the goats, the call to minister to the poor, the sick, the widow, the orphan, the refugee, and the prisoner. And this is a matter of concern for both the church and the state because it is first and foremost a spiritual concern for all Christians. The church is responsible for the spiritual governance, for the spiritual nurturing of all believers, while the state oversees the establishment of civil justice and outward morality. However, in establishing the latter, the state needs to be grounded in the former that spiritual and inward kingdom of Christ. Now, I mentioned earlier that Calvin uh, was not a citizen of Geneva, that he never held public office, and he couldn't even vote. And yet he had a huge impact on Genevan politics, and he did so from the pulpit, um, because our, the elected officers in Geneva were Christians and were under his pastoral care. He felt he had the, the authority then to call them to task when they were governing in ways that were against the word of God. And so if you, if you, if you want to learn Latin and then want to go peruse the, the minutes of the, the city council in Geneva, it's just fascinating to see how many times they mentioned Calvin. In fact, they always wrote about him as illegalis, that Frenchman. 
is they resented the fact that he was French and he had so, so much authority and power in Geneva as pastor. Um, but Calvin um, had no problems shaming public officials and calling them to task uh, when they um, acted in ways that were contrary to the word of God. Next week, we're going to look at the social welfare ministries. Um, there's an image of Calvin. He preached twice on Sundays, once on Wednesday. Um, he taught at the Geneva Academy, which was a university and seminary for the formation of, of clergy. And the other image is the hospital there in Geneva. Um, we need to remember that when, when we hear the word hospital, today we think of, of a place for people who are sick. Um, but the word hospital comes from the word for hospitality. And so in the Middle Ages and in the Reformation, a hospital was a place that anyone who needed aid, whether they were hungry, whether they were traveling and needed a place to stay, whether they were political refugees, um, you know, fill in the blank. Whatever the need, the hospital would be the place to, to find help and assistance. And in Geneva, the hospital was run by the church and by the board of deacons. And so we're going to see next week how um, all of the kind of social welfare networks that we take for granted, public education, uh, public health, um, you know, assistance to the poor and the needy, uh, education, you know, fill in the blank, all those things um, Calvin saw as part of the church's outreach and the church's ministry. And yes, the state had responsibility, but whenever the state failed to meet its responsibility, Calvin as pastor would, would push back on the state. And if the state refused to do something, he would then go to the church and say, well, it's up to so, for example, Calvin wanted public education in Geneva to be kindergarten through 12th grade. The city government felt that that was too expensive, especially since a lot of the, the teenage children would often help in their family's farm or their family's businesses. And so they only agreed to fund public education grades K through 8. Well, then Calvin went to the church and said, well, we need to open a school to educate those children grades nine through 12. And the church did it. Um, so, so again, for Calvin, the church, state exists to provide for, for social welfare, for uh, equity, uh, peace, justice. But whenever the, the state failed to do so, it was the church's responsibility to step in and do it. Um, so I, I'm going to stop there and, and open things up and uh, conversation. Let me, uh, exit my presentation all right, all right. um looks like uh john page would like to know uh he says i'd like to know more about geneva in the 16th century why was it attractive as a refugee yeah. landing area yeah uh and wasn't geneva during this time quasi independent as a city state well, that's a dirty was... question yeah, Geneva was an independent city-state. It had been part of the, the Catholic cantons. And when the Evangelical uh, Reformation began, it forcibly pushed the Catholic nobility out of Geneva. And so it was very much a, 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 a Reformation led not by the nobility, but by the mercantile class, the, the upper middle class. And they established a new government, and it was failing, and they felt all sorts of pressure from the surrounding Catholic cantons. Um, they had very little farm land, and so they had to maintain trade relations with all their Catholic neighbors, um, which created all sorts of tensions. So long story short, Calvin was drafted by uh, William Farrell, who was the, the head pastor in Geneva. Um, Calvin was fleeing Paris, he was on his way to Strasbourg and was sidetracked to Geneva at the request of, of William Farrell. He agreed then to stay and for three years was implementing the reforms in Geneva. But the city government was hesitant to impose a Protestant confession of faith on all Genevans because of these political 
tensions with their Catholic neighbors. And so Calvin uh, refused. He said, um, I will not administer communion on Easter Sunday unless we agree that all Genevan citizens adopt the, the Protestant confession of faith. Um, so they kicked Calvin out. And so Calvin left. And for three years, it, it worked in Basel with the poor. And if you read Calvin's journals, it, he, he called it the happiest years of his life because he had no huge burdens on him. He was just preaching the gospel and ministering to the poor. He lived a very simple life. Well, Geneva was falling apart. The Catholic nobility was, was eyeing the city and was going to retake it. And so they appealed to Calvin, welcomed him back, and agreed to not only let him lead the Reformation, of, but they also invited him. Remember, Calvin was not a trained theologian. He was a trained lawyer. They invited Calvin to write the Constitution of Geneva. And so when he came back, um, he wrote a constitution that became kind of a, a hallmark. It was uh, one that tolerated religious uh, difference. You could be a, a, uh, a Catholic and live there. You could be a Jew and live there. But if you wanted uh, to have a say in how the city was run, you had to be a Protestant. That, that's what passed for tolerance in the 16th century, as opposed to being forcibly converted. Um, ironically, he wrote the Constitution, which led to the new did not have a vote, he did not have rights, and couldn't participate in, in public governance for most of his life in Geneva until about five years before his death when they made him a citizen. So, um, can you Geneva, talk a little bit about? Oh, yes. go ahead. No, I was going to say to answer the other part of the question, Geneva became attractive because uh, Calvin convinced the, the city fathers that. Uh, much like they welcomed him, if, if Protestantism is going to take root in Europe, we need to, to welcome all these refugees, and then we need to help them resettle. We can't all, they can't all live in Geneva, and so the academy, the academy existed to train pastors to then evangelize Europe and to go establish Protestant communities throughout Europe and eventually throughout the world. Um, so, so you, you've, you've talked about Calvin, you've talked about um, Presbyterian clergy in the colonies. Um, can you talk a little bit, because I know some people who are signed up for this are United Methodists. And so talk mm -hmm. about how, because Calvinism isn't just relate, isn't just limited to the Presbyterian church. It, yeah. You know, it, yeah. it, talk about its influence in the Church of England that would have shaped John Wesley in ways that exactly. people can recognize here. Exactly. Well, um, Elizabeth, when she was implementing the, the, the reforms um, in, in, in England, um, was in contact with Calvin's Geneva and invited representatives from Geneva to, to guide. So, so is it that the 39 articles of the Anglican Church are very reformed in their mm -hmm. theology. Where Elizabeth broke with the Calvinists was on liturgy. She loved the visual arts too much. She loved me too much. And she found the Van Salter deadly dull. The a cappella singing of the, of the Psalms as the only liturgical music she, she did not like. And so what she found was this middle way between the reforms in Geneva and what the more radical Presbyterians wanted in Scotland and evil Catholic tradition. And, and that's what Anglicanism became, kind of a middle ground. But its theology, as far as its doctrines of election, as far as its understanding of uh, the sacraments, um, et cetera, was very much um, in keeping with, uh, you know, re the Reformed confessions at the time. So would you say that that's, so, so that, um you know, so the same sort of moral vision for the greater good that, that, that Wesley has. Um, Definitely. In I mean, keeping I, with that. Yeah. I think there's more in common between um, Wesley and Calvin than you'll find between Luther and Wesley. Because mm -hmm. um, there is this notion in Calvinist spirituality of, of a pilgrimage, of a journey, of a gradual growth and maturation in the faith which I think is closer to, to kind of 
the, the Methodist understanding of, of striving for perfection, right? And, and so you don't find that in Luther. And Luther was suspicious of anything that seemed to reintroduce the spiritual to God of medieval spirituality. Mm -hmm. For Calvin, it wasn't this ladder to God, but, but rather this, this journey that we're on and, and that as long as we're in this life, we, we haven't been glorified yet. We've been justified. We're in the process of being sanctified, but we, you know, we, we can always grow in the faith. Um, whereas for Luther, it was kind of this either or, either you've, you've been saved or you haven't. And, and, and really that, that seems, that's something that, that Lutheran spirituality has struggled with the, the, you know, how do you then deal with people who are not and yet have been born again, right? How do you then mm -hmm. account for that? Um, Whereas for, for the Calvinists, he, he did take Luther's simul use to set peccator, or at once a sinner and, and, um, and justified very seriously. But for, for Calvin, you have this fact that, that the work of justification on the cross is once and for all, for all people. The work of sanctification is, is, is within us by the work of the Spirit, and that's ongoing. And he called it the double hinge of faith. Um, everything turns on this on the fact that that yes we we're saved once and for all but we experience it um as a journey you know the mm -hmm. the, the ordo salute is the order of salvation um for calvin we experience it one way it happens another way it begins with the work of god but we experience it as a personal conversion mm. and and so Calvin earned the name the theologian of the Holy Spirit. If you read his, his institutes carefully, the beginning of book three, where he starts to describe Christian life after conversion, that's for him where he says, that's where it begins. Because it's a work of God and God's grace, I've organized the book this way. Um, you know, creation, God, right? Christology, salvation, then spirit and the work of the church but we experience it as conversion and so mm -hmm. um, he said that you could very easily begin this book here in book three move it to the beginning and because that's how we experience um, so so i think that there's a lot there with methodism and wesley and this notion of 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 a, of, of a journey guided by by the work of the spirit and this kind of internal transformation that's mediated by the spirit i think it was schleiermacher who said that we we experience god by going backwards through the creed yeah um that's a similar point he, he was a he was a calvinist <laughs> <laughs> um so so uh just to to wrap up here i want to respect your time um you and i know you want to talk about immigration and and race in the coming sessions but you but you mentioned kind of the recent events and so i'm wondering um from you know the insurrection at the capitol and just everything that people are experiencing and processing right now um are, are there any lessons um for public engagement that you find in calvin right now well if, if there's a lesson and and i'll talk in greater detail about it it's it's that of of the the pastor interjecting himself herself in, in public matters. Um, in 1555, at the height of these waves of immigration of foreigners moving into Geneva, a, a, a nativist movement began in Geneva, an uh, uh, anti-immigration movement. Um, and it was led by a local merchant who led a, a march of, of native Genevans um, and was protesting foreign owned businesses were damaging storefronts very much like Kristallnacht right in Germany during the rise of Nazism and eventually um, occupied the council the city council chambers much like what happened in the Capitol building and they were chanting kill the French kill the French at which point Calvin entered that space with 
all the witnesses there with all the councilmen, uh, council members there and basically said, um, if you're going to kill the French, then you need to start with me. And basically bared his chest and dared this mob to kill him. Thank God, right? You know, that the cooler heads prevailed, that, that those who were in power in the city government realized we can't let this mob run out of control. And, you know, they, they pretty much arrested everyone who was part of the protest. And eventually the native born Genevan was exiled from Geneva. Um, he, was, he had a whole political party called the Libertines that were against Calvin. And, and they viewed Calvin as this kind of uh, theocrat who was imposing morality on everyone. And that's why they called themselves the Libertines. And they were calling themselves a liberation movement. But what they were was, was a racist, ethnocentric, you know, anti-immigrant party that, that was using violence to intimidate. And, and Calvin risked his life as pastor. Remember, he, he had no authority to tell the city government, arrest that man or do this or do that. He simply went there as pastor and basically said, you know, if you're going to kill uh, the immigrants in our community, then you need to start with me. That's, that's prophetic, right? Mm -hmm. That's pretty awesome. We don't and, and maybe like to, to go back to one of your earlier slides, um, you know, Calvin's third use of the law in terms of one of the things the law does is give us, you know, even if we can't do it perfectly, it gives us a trajectory to pursue in, Something in to life. And maybe, for, yeah. and maybe that um, is what helps us discern um, movements and, and, and developments in our time. And, and so, what we should participate in and what we should call out. Yeah, yeah. And for, for, for Calvin, um, he, he was not a, a cool, level-headed person sometimes. Sometimes he would push the city council too far. Um, but, but he was also, I think, mature enough and, and receptive enough of criticism to recognize when he'd done that, right? So he wasn't a hothead. Um, and so he was always trying to figure out, okay, where, you know, where is the church ca called to be? Mm -hmm. And then where is the state in relation to that? And, and if we're too far off the track, then, then the church has already called the state out. And so the, the Calvin lived between two texts. One was Romans 13, right? To obey the, the state because the state was, was instituted by God. But the other was Acts 5-4, I think, that you shouldn't do anything that's against the word of God. And for Calvin, um, he erred on the side of, it's better to obey the word of God than it is to obey the state when the state is ordering you to disobey God. And that's why H.R. Uh, Niebuhr in the 20th century um, kind of lifted Calvin up as, as one of those examples of, of the uh, Christ transforming the world. You know, he had these five archetypes of, of different ways the Christian churches relate to, to the secular world. And, and for, for him, Calvin was the, the paradigm of the church is called not to govern the, the secular world, but through its example, transform the secular world. And I like to use the word, and this is where I think that the liberationists contribute much to it, um, the church is counterculture, which is, which is, you know, in, in, in our heavily secularized world, that's all the, that we're going to get <laughs> is to be a counterculture. Be because the alternative is, is look, look at these, these religious extremist movements that want to reinstate a Christian nation and a Christian state. You know, that's authoritarian. That is imposing and denying people the freedom that, that God hasn't taken away. So who are we to take it from others, right? Um, and, and it can be scary. It can become violent and coerced. And, and despite all of the, the, the attacks on Calvin that, that label him as a theocrat, um, he did not impose religion on others. He said, well, if, if you want to join us and be part of this experiment, you know, you need to affirm our faith. But there were Catholics living in Geneva and they were trading freely with Protestants and, you know, so forth and so on. So it's, um, 
a lot of the seeds for, for a, our modern diverse culture were, were kind of planted there in Geneva. And so much so that a century later when Jean-Jacques Rousseau was, was writing and living in Geneva, Geneva was this haven of European cosmopolitanism where, where political refugees from all over um, Europe ended up there. Even Dostoevsky, the Russian uh, novelist, ended up in Geneva. Now he hated Geneva, but <laughs> but that's that's a whole other story. But my point is that that whenever there were political refugees whose lives were at risk elsewhere, they would always be welcomed in Geneva, and they'd be welcomed because of Geneva's Christian identity and their theology of of exile, of welcoming refugees. Well, Ruben, um, I want to thank you. Uh, so next week we're going to talk about what? So next week we're going to look at at the social welfare ministries in Geneva as a okay. paradigm for how we ought to engage social ministries today. Um, and the only negative thing I would say is that you mentioned, you quoted both Calvin and Hobbes, but didn't have a cartoon anywhere. I know, I thought it'd be too obvious so. if I did that. <laughs> that um, was in fact I, uh, my intention though. So cool, you picked up on it. <laughs> I actually have a uh, Vespers prayer here from Calvin, so I'll pray us out. Thank you. Oh, Lord God, now grant us the grace not only to rest our bodies this night, but to have our spiritual repose in soul and conscience in your grace and love, that we may let go of all earthly cares so that we might be comforted and eased in all ways. And because no day passes that we don't sin in so many ways, please bury all our offenses in your mercy so that we might not lose your presence. Forgive us, merciful Father, for Christ's sake. And as we lay down to sleep for safely to wake again only by your grace, keep us in a joyful, lively remembrance that whatever happens, we will someday know our final rising, the resurrection, because Jesus Christ laid down in death for us and rose for our justification. In his name we pray this night. Amen. Amen.